um, Psalm 27, verse 14, Psalm 37, verse 9, and Psalm 123, verse 2 explain how nothing ever worked out for me when I tried to go out on my own and get married like I was told by my family. You need to marry and settle down, you know. Didn't work out for me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, and 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 talk about how mod immodest worldly apparel leads to sin in various ways, essentially speaking. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 describes why I was never ever content with going to these stupid Catholic Lutheran Baal buildings throughout my life. And every time I transferred to a different school, because I was in search of a perfect school at the time, all those years, you know, I always became very grieved and vexed and bored by the curriculum and pace of the work. Why? Because of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. And ironically, the Lord worked it out through my Boston mentor in 2011 to drive home the point to me that there is no perfect school. I don't care what the name of the university is. There is nothing perfect out there for, you know, your perfect fit. So don't even try. Just don't even go to university, okay? It's not worth it. So, continuing in 2007 to 2008, I attended this Catholic Lutheran uh, bail house, and this one, this one lady that I was somewhat of an acquaintance with told me that her husband used to be a Roman Catholic, but because Roman Catholicism and Lutheranism are extremely similar, it was very easy for him to convert to Lutheranism. That was a wake-up call from the Lord Jesus Christ to say, you know, Lutheran is, Lutherans are Catholics in disguise, to put it nicely. You know, he, the Lord showed me the truth about the connections between Catholicism and Catholicism and Lutheranism. For, as 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 and 16 describes. Then I was exposed to the Chronicles of Narnia TV program for a little bit at a friend's house, you know, professing Christian friend's house. And I didn't understand what I was watching. But later on, the Lord taught me that Chronicles of Narnia is very, very satanic and occultic. And if you don't believe me, check it out for yourself. Read what the Bible says and check it out for yourself. I also learned the, uh, the agenda behind what's called Crosswalk, which is a program, a works-based Catholic program put on by the Church of Christ, generally speaking, and other organizations of Protestants. And uh, again, the agenda of, I'm a good person, I'm a Christian because I'm a good person, you know, and I do good things for others, so that makes me a Christian. You know, <clears throat> I couldn't understand why I was bothered by it, but I was, you know. And in 2008, I ended up attending a, uh, a German class at a, at a Catholic Lutheran university, the parochial university, also in my quest to find truth. And there, ironically, you know, the Lord put a Bavarian teacher in my path. I didn't know it at the time, but my instructor was from Munchen in Bavaria, and she taught me the, the German language and some of the culture and customs and whatnot of, of my ancestors' home country, and it didn't dawn on me at the time, but I, I was having trouble learning it because, again, I'm, I do not learn well in a classroom environment. I've always hated classroom environments. But nonetheless, the Lord showed me through that, through that program, through that uh, course, that, um, you know, that was actually my best class at that, at that university, ironically. The German class was the best one that I succeeded at the most. <laughs> and um, so then in 2007 to 2010, I joined the Navy Reserves, and I was an operations specialist with an with a active secret security clearance. Daniel chapter 8, verse 22, and Luke chapter 8, verse 17, and John 7, verse 4, explain the security clearance agenda. And uh, Psalm 101, 3 ex explains why I couldn't understand, but was bothered by this occultic TV show that I used to watch earlier that year before my K-12 
Catholic parochial university. And, um, <clears throat> and so because of my past army experience, unfortunately, I had to talk to a shrink, you know. And the shrink asked me, well, why don't you stay out of the military? Because of my self-righteous pride and my family tradition of military service, starting with my father and other people in my family, you know, um, I, I told the, the shrink that, you know, I have to carry on my family tradition of, mili excuse me, of military service and, you know, all these other excuses to justify my sin of wanting to go back to the military. Because I had felt like, oh, well, maybe there's something else out there, you know. Same thing with the military I did with the university. There's a perfect branch out there for me to join. Surely there's got to be a perfect branch out there, you know. And there wasn't. The Lord intensely educated me throughout those years that it wasn't my forte. For instance, a professing Christian while I was deployed in the sandbox in 2010, you know, asked me if I had heard of Rex 84. You know, and I said, what's Rex 84? And he said, look it up. And I'm like, huh? Well, just, just tell me what it means. He's like, look it up. So I looked it up. And I learned that uh, that was the first piece of the puzzle to understanding why people over the years after high school said that the, U the, that the United States of America is nicknamed the Great Satan to all the other countries across the world outside the U.S. I never understood that till I went on deployment with the Navy in 2010 to the sandbox, Iraq, Kuwait area, so to speak, for OEF, OIF scam, you know, totalitarianism essentially. And, <clears throat> and so I searched for the truth and that gave me a whole new outlook on, on my country. And I said, oh boy, well, I really hope, you know, I don't die in combat, you know, not knowing what my mission would be. But then the Lord used my commander before I left my home command, before I went to my MOB station across the country. He said, you'll come back, you know, you'll survive, you'll come back as second class, you know, and uh, you'll come back. I know you will, or something like that. And I'm like, where is he getting this idea from, you know? And so the Lord used that commander at the time to, uh, to wake me up to the fact that I wasn't going to die. But there were times over there I thought, I wish I could die, because what do I have to live for, you know? My country is, is evil, you know, I can't do anything right, so I thought, growing up, you know. Everything I, I had ever known and taken pride in in the past was just like, just going away. The Lord was just slowly but surely eating away at my pride in all these other things throughout my life that I had been falsely raised to believe in, ignorantly. And so, you know, so I started looking at that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Luke 11, verses 9 and 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, describe that experience, you know. And during that deployment, I got into ventriloquism a little bit. I started watching this uh, famous national ventriloquist, I can't think of what his name is, uh, possibly Jeff Dunham or something, Durham, I don't know. But... <clears throat> He has this ventriloquist shell that he puts on throughout the country and throughout the world. And, uh, you know, I didn't understand the agenda behind that, so I didn't think much of it. I watched that in my spare time, unfortunately. And while I was deployed, I was a systems administrator and an information management officer. And uh, there I learned all sorts of things in the technology industry. I even learned the fact that the technology agenda is based solely on the fact of machines, they, they want machines to, to replace people, for starters, and if they can't replace people with machines, they want to integrate machines and people together to make them cyborgs, you know, and this is one of the so-called, uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff behind it that I don't remember very much, but you know, the whole agenda behind the security clearance thing ties in with this, you know, cyborg, machines replacing people, constant 
exacerbating technologies and everything. You can never ever learn everything in the technology industry. There's a reason for that, okay? And that's why I'm very, very technology resistant to this day. But, you know, I help out when I can as needed. And, uh, you know, I, but I try to limit my time with, with technology because I know what it does. I know what it's intended to do. And uh, <clears throat> so a coworker also told me, you know, before and after I got overseas, he said, you march to the beat of your own drum. You don't have to be the best at everything, you know? But he initially said, you march to the beat of your own drum. And I thought, what in the world? What are you talking about, you know? I've done all this great success in my military years. I've done this and that. And he's like, you're, you're not a conformist. You try to be a conformist, but you're not a conformist. And I, and I just kind of chewed on that idea over time and I thought to myself, yeah, you know, that's right, you know. The Lord put that coworker in my life to drive home that point to me because I was starting to doubt what I was doing. And I started to lose my pride in serving my country at that time to realize that uh, I didn't need to, you know, torture myself anymore by conforming to something that I was never supposed to conform or be a part of from the beginning. So then the Lord put a professing Christian girl, you know, across my path. Um, and she claimed to be a Christian, of course, but yet she would boast about performing these fleshly dance routines during the quote unquote church services on base where I was stationed and uh, dressed in the entire of an harlot, you know, and what did that lead to? If she ever got in trouble, it was just a slap on the wrist or just slide underneath the rug, slide underneath the rug, you know. But I'm a Christian, even though I dress like, an, like a harlot. Uh-huh. And there are other, lots of other people who profess to be Christians, but they never, ever present the gospel to me. They all did the same things I was into. Worldly trends, worldly music, you name it. There's no difference between those Christians and me. You know, and so Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, and Titus chapter 1, verse 16, define, you know, my, my lesson from the Lord about if you, about my experience dealing with that professing Christian girl, you know, who got a slap on the wrist if she did something wrong or the case thrown out when she sinned, essentially. It explains why that, why, why that was the case. And the ironic part about that whole deployment experience was this. You know, I was told before I went overseas, oh, don't talk to the locals, don't do this, you know, just just treat people this certain way, you know. And if a, and I was also told this in training over there. If you see a girl walking around in, you know, jeans or whatever her attire was, you know, um, just be nice to her because, you know, don't treat her like scum essentially because she's dressed in inappropriate attire, you know? Just because she's dressed a certain way doesn't mean she wants to be taken advantage of is essentially how they, you know, implicitly defined it in their training to essentially say, just cover up the sin, you know, let people be as they are, let them do what they want, just put your head in the sand, don't worry about it. And that was the diversity training you know, anti-harassment training. And so uh, I learned over there that the locals in the Middle East treated me much better than my own country did, than my own unit did. And I say that from the standpoint of they were always nice, you know, to me when, uh, when I had purchases to make at the local eateries on base, you know. I remember one time I was a few cents short, unfortunately, for paying for my, my purchase in cash. And, and uh, the guy actually like helped me out that one time. So I learned the agenda behind the neoconservative imperialistic agenda of bomb other terrorist countries because you know, they're terrorist, ah, you know. And uh, so then I got, because I spoke truth again about the Navy's agenda, I got forced into a psychological evaluation, command directed. 
you know? And that's because people greedily take credit for other people's work. You know, the Hegelian de dialectic, the ends justify the means. Step on other people's toes in order to get to where you want to be in your career. You know, that's what happened to me. And when I spoke the truth about what they did to me, you know, they're like, oh, you need, you need to go to shrink. So then, in August of that year, my maternal grandmother died, and I learned the truth about the nursing home and pharmaceutical agenda. Jeremiah 6, 16, and Jeremiah 46, 11 describe that. And Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 5, and Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, verse 16, describe the agenda of stepping on other people's toes to get to where you want to be in your career. And so I was honorably discharged the next month, in September of 2010, despite a biased board. And by God's grace and mercy, I had a very, very good witness test testify on my behalf. And, um, <clears throat> and the Lord showed me through that experience, you know, because of Proverbs chapter 20, verse 22, that friends in this world will betray, your, be, will betray you quicker than you can say, oh no. I guarantee it. And also, great connections at work, networking, and your job or social life only applies if you conform and stay in their system, if you don't buck the system, and if you don't ask questions, and if you don't seek the truth. That is the only way you will get your connections. Uh-huh. And if you leave their system, if you speak out against their system, either before or after you leave, they will destroy you personally, professionally, character-wise, you name it. They will destroy you. Okay? So then I attended my last attempt at university. I went to Boston thinking, great, I'll go to finally the perfect school, you know, online and offline classes. And I learned that, you know, the grocery store card agenda of, do you have a store card with us? You know, you shop at Giant, you shop at Tops, you shop at whatever that requires you to have a store card in order to purchase there. That's already the mark of these technology. They just won't claim it as such. But they'll ask you when you go up to that shopping, to that checkout line, do you have a card with us? No. And then they'll make you feel like dirt because you don't have one. And that's, they make you feel like you can only get that discount at their grocery store for those items you're purchasing if you have their, their mark, I mean, their card. You know, I learned that very well. And uh, I also learned that a solid work ethic means nothing in this day and age, whether it's the career force, the government, and all its varieties, whether it's university or anything you do, a solid work ethic means nothing anymore compared to who you know. And I also, again, learned, you know, if you, if you work at your own pace, which is faster than the pace of the class in your university years, you will be treated like an abject and you will be calumniated for it because they say, this is not a self-paced class. You need to stay with the class and not work ahead. You know, and yet, I also learned the, the agenda behind being forced to have health insurance as a university student in, in Boston. They don't care what your status is. You are required to have health insurance. That's communism. Okay? And then I also learned there that, uh, that when I tried to, to take Polka and Waltz classes as an extracurricular activity funded and sponsored by my Catholic uh, bagel building, you know, I learned that uh, the polka and waltz classes were actually easier for me to learn than all the years of me trying to learn ballet, tap, tumbling, and jazz. And so I learned after, over time, after I left that area, that uh, the Lord designed me to like that type of music rather than the tap, jazz, ballet type of things that I used to try and learn how to do. And uh, the Lord was, was giving me another clue. Embrace your kindred, essentially. And so my papist wannabe hireling over in Boston, Mr. Ingo Dutzman, told me one day, don't take the Bible literally. When I saw a picture of a 
a place that's been burning for many, many years, you know, through an online photo one time. A deep cavern or a deep um, pit in the earth was, was burning for some reason, constantly burning, and nobody knew why. And he told me to not take the Bible literally, ironically, because I related to the Bible at the time. And so John 15 verse 18 talks about, you know, the mindset of that, being told don't take the Bible literally. So basically, in all my lost years, you know, up to this point, I had tried everything, almost literally everything the world had to offer me, and yet my life had no meaning, no purpose, no contentment, nothing. I still felt like, why am I on this earth? Why was I made? You know? Why? Because Ecclesiast Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 10 and 11, Mark chapter 8 verses 35 through 37, and James chapter 4 verse 4 explain why I felt that way. It was because the Lord was showing me through all these experiences that nothing this world has to offer means anything compared to being saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved from your sins. Nothing compares to being saved by the Lord Jesus Christ and learning from his word, the King James Bible. And so, um, continuing in spring 2011, at that time that I was out in Boston to keep my mind occupied and keep myself, you know, um, to keep myself from being idle, I had volunteered at an equestrian center on the weekends during my academic quarters. And so the Lord showed me through that opportunity that working with animals kept me sober and temperate despite how I was being treated at the university. You know, despite having a 4.0 in Boston, which means nothing nowadays. I mean, anybody can get a 4.0 if they just conform hard enough. <laughs> it means nothing. You know, you look at the 1800 standards of education, it meant more than it does today. You know, the Lord also blessed me with two deeply discounted books to show me more truth. A horse encyclopedia and a book called Better Off, Flipping the Switch on Technology by Eric Brendy. Those, that book was key to me understanding I want to diminish the technology in my life. I'm sick and tired of this technology curriculum of, you know, not being told the truth about the uh, about what's going on with the technology developments and yet it all relates to the same thing it always go back to the same thing no matter what new term the technology industry tells you about a certain product it's already been done just like proverbs says there's nothing new under the sun nothing you know the lord drilled that lesson home to me mightily that time and so that caused me to to uh, gain a militant zeal for the truth, no matter what it cost me, because of all the deception that I had endured up to that point. And John 14, verse 6, and 16, verse 13, and chapter 13, verse 16, describe that. Why the Lord showed me that, and had me go through that experience. So then, that led to me, re me reading and renting the book, The Islamic Antichrist by Joel Richardson and around that time, and uh, the Lord used that book. I don't know if he used the King James Bible or what version of the Bible he used, but I do know that the Lord used that book to show me the New World Order agenda and how what was happening to me and throughout my life and all the different events across the world up, up, at, up until that point in time was confirming biblical prophecy. And so that caused me Finishing that book and reading that book caused me to sleep on with to sleep the to sleep with all the lights on in my room. I literally did not shut off any lights that night while I was reading that book, you know. And throughout all the nights that I read that book, and I read it until I fell asleep each night till it was done, and that kept me content and at least aware of what why what was happening was happening and how it was happening. And so uh, I slept with all the lights on and the, and the covers pulled over my head because I was scared to death of trying to survive this world any longer without God in my life. 
despite me saying, yeah, I know God, you know, all this other profession I used to make, you know? And so, uh, so after that, um, you know, I had run in across another professing Christian who claimed that, yeah, I'm a Christian, you know, because I went to a Bible college in New York, but yet he mocked his, his grandmother and he mocked the way she did things and the old things that she believed in. And that rubbed me the wrong way. And in my mind, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. I don't know why, but it doesn't sound right. A Christian would mock his grandmother and how she does things and the things she believes in? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and I also condemned sodomy when I was out there in Boston. I literally yelled out, you know, this is, this is the modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah when I was in Boston one day in front of him and he tried to calm me down and I'm like, no, I'm not going to calm down. And there was another time or two I spoke up truth about at the, at the tea station on my way home from campus on a number of occasions and, and I had spoke up truth about, you know, what was going on in the world. And this one guy came up to me and tried to calm me down and I said, no, I'll die for God if I have to, even though I wasn't saved but I still believed that I had no problem dying for God if that's what he wanted me to do, you know? So, and at the same time, I, I also attended a Students for, Demo for a Democratic Society meeting on campus because I was trying to, in my unfortunate, ignorant mind, I was trying to develop a student organization for student veterans on campus because they had no place to go if they needed a quiet study area like I did, you know, in order for me to concentrate on what I'm doing, I have to have a pin drop quiet area to study and think in. And there was nothing like that there. So I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just create this student organization. And that fell through. And the Lord put this Roman Catholic across my path out there too, you know. He's, he asked me about the differences between Catholics and Lutherans, you know, and I couldn't tell them. I figured, well, well, you have a master's. Why don't you tell me, you know? And so I forgot to mention this a moment ago, but the book, The Islamic Antichrist, reading that made me scared enough that I cried out to God for protection from this, from this wicked world, essentially. And Psalm chapter 6, verse 9, and Psalm 142, verses 1 through 4 describe that experience. So then I attended a Bible study at my Catholic Baal house, which made me question my faith in Catholic Lutheranism. And the Lord used a perversion Bible to speak truth to me. And the verse was Luke chapter 17, verse 33. And I had heard, you know, I had read that in, a, in the NIV or whatever perversion I was using at the time. And I had said my interpretation of it and people glared at me. I'm like, I don't know, just what I think, you know. And so I kept that in my mind all that time, and it really troubled me. That verse really troubled me because I didn't understand what it meant, but I wanted to know. And so, uh, so the assistant papist who, wanted, who, who conducted that Bible study, Paul Lance, his favorite author was, was C.S. Lewis. And ironically, C.S. Lewis is an occultist, just like J.R.R. Tolkien, and the author of the Harry Potter series. And uh, he constantly ranted and raved, you know, about C.S. Lewis being such an inspiration and a motivation in his life. And uh, I wasn't a fan of C.S. Lewis in, back in university. And so that led me also at Boston, I learned the truth about the VA's fascist Montgomery GI Bill, and also the RFID public transit system, access cards, and technology agenda. I learned several things from the Lord there. I learned first and foremost from the VA director that, that uh, you know, that he asked me one day, he said, what makes your form of welfare different than all the others? Because at that time, I was thinking, I'm going to use my GI Bill benefits to pay for college. You know? And, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> the, 
you know, he actually cornered me on, about that, and I had no idea that the GI Bill, that the VA system had anything to do with government welfare. In my mind, I said, I earned it, you know, I served the time to get my GI Bill benefits. But in actuality, I was on welfare, just like everybody else. And yes, I found documentation to prove that, and I'll show you that later on when the documentation is done. And so I also learned that when the public transportation system is down in terms of inclement weather, rain, snow, whatever happens to it, you know, and it's, oh, you can't get anywhere on the T or the bus or whatever the case may be. If you actually walk your two feet that God gave you from point A to point B, you can actually outwalk the public transit system on foot, just walking at a normal pace. And that's what the Lord showed me. So Luke 17 verse 33 is a very good verse that, that hit home with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10 and 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. Again, also proved, home, proved to me the Lord's lesson to me that uh, there's no time to cater to individual learning styles. Because you got to have the money, you know. And there's no time to... Uh, you know, use cash in a public transit system because you got to have the money and time is money, you know. And all these other lessons that the Lord showed me out there relate to those verses. So I learned uh, after I left D or after I left Boston, I was I went to get my stuff out of storage in July of that year, and the Lord put a Christian woman from D.C. I'm pretty sure she was saved because. She was dressed very modestly. She actually talked about, you know, her testimony. She told me her testimony on the train, you know, and she gave me a bunch of verses that she had written out, and she said, I want you to look up these verses, and I did when I got home, you know, and I tried to pick her brain, but she's like, I, I can't right now because my stop is coming up pretty soon, you know, so the Lord put her in my path to help, to help me learn more truth, and John chapter 17, verse 17 you know, Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yeah, that experience drilled that home to me. So I ended up uh, learning upon renting a car to go home after I got my stuff out of storage. I learned to not have fellowship with Freemasons because the so-called friend I used to know from the military was a Mason. And the last time I talked to him, he was a 32nd degree Mason with still one more level to go in the Masonic branch that that is. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 describe that. Then I also learned that if you drive, you know, the speed limit and nothing more, 60 miles per hour on long road trips, the Lord showed me that you, you get more gas mileage per mile and you save money over the long distance road trip if you set it on cruise at 60 miles an hour. So, um, then uh, also a few, few days later, the Lord put a Roman Catholic Navy sailor who I used to serve with in the Navy, who told me, I feel very comfortable attending both Catholic and Lutheran services, because we got into a debate about Catholic versus Lutheranism again, <laughs> you know? And the Lord used this lost person to convict me of my pride, you know, what was left of my pride in Lutheranism, and my sin of listening to CCM music from Michael W. Smith and other artists from Aid Association for Lutherans and Thrive at Financial Music CDs that I was given years ago. And John chapter 13 verse 16 describes that. So then in August, I, I visited an Iowa State Fair Civil War reenactment exhibit where I learned about the herbal medicines and the medicines that they used to use. And I even visited this one exhibit where this lady was talking about in a modest outfit from that era she was explaining all the different customs and traditions of that time and I thought it was fascinating and I remember saying I would gladly give up my pants for a modest dress like that or for a dress like that so the Lord used that particular exhibit to show me what a lady should look like and why that era gives a lot of good examples to learn from that are biblically based. So then I got a, 
a, a few books on creation science and a book on an article about the differences between amillennial and millennial or what the Lutherans call chiliastic beliefs from a Catholic Lutheran hireling and the Lord used this to tell me truth but I didn't understand what this amillennialism stuff was until after I got saved and so during this time the, the Lord you know and and his Holy Spirit gave me this zeal this intense passion for learning the truth and searching for online King James Bible believing ministries to join and John chapter 16 verse 13 talks about that and this caused me to delve deeply into the Bible version issue through a website called Jesus Tech is Tech Savior.com. Tech is just a military term for a dash, if you don't know what that is. And 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11 describe why I had that intense desire to delve deeply into the Bible version issue. And so I felt strongly called by the Lord to tell the to tell people, every single person I ran across in my life, to tell them about the King James Bible. And I felt called to be to be a King James Bible believing missionary um, and so Romans chapter 8 verse 28 verses and and first Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 describe describe the reasoning describe why I felt such a strong desire to tell people about the King James Bible you know everybody I came across so then in, in September I bought a, a, and received a 1611 King James Bible, and, and then I later got into a, into a conversation with my mother, and she said, well, Grandma used to have a King James Bible. I wonder if we can find hers. So we made a deal. If, if we could find hers in 24 hours, I would ship that one back that I just received but never opened. So, praise the Lord, we found Grandma's heirloom King James Red Letter Teaching Bible. And so, just as I had promised Mom, I sent back the one that I had ordered from online and uh, got my money back. And so, then that same month, I attended a church picnic at the request, excuse me, of my boss, my plant manager at my warehouse job at the time that I had had since early August. And this was during the September 11th weekend. And the professing Christians there you know, calumniated me for loving the old hymns and for a whole bunch of other reasons, not liking this worldly music anymore. My taste went from pop culture music to classical and old hymns. And I started thinking back to the old hymns I'd grown up with. And there I learned what a seducing female pastor looks and acts like. You know, both sets of pastors were married couple, husband and wife being pastors. And it was a charismaniac Pentecostal uh, cult, to put it nicely. And I have documentation to prove that too, so uh, I'll, I'll let you know that. And um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 13 describes what I went through in that experience. So basically, the Lord showed me from all those experiences the, the simple fact, how you dress determines how people will treat you. If you're dressed modestly, you're going to get treated like a lady, the lady you should be. If you're wearing pants, you will be treated like a man, to put it nicely. And I also read the book, The Marketing of Evil, and a book on spiritual warfare for more truth that month. And uh, The Marketing of Evil, I believe, was written by an author who uses the King James Bible to back up the information in his book. And that woke me up to why, you know, whole bunch of things had happened, you know. The abortion agenda was, was called Planned Parenthood, among other things. And so, the next month, after traveling and searching for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ my entire life, and thinking I could find Him in an institution, you know, at a university or whatever the case may be, I had emailed Brian one day in early October, I believe it was the third, and I had asked him, if I could join a King James Bible believing focused ministry, a King James Bible focused ministry. And he emailed me back and he said, 
Well, I'm not sure if there is any like that, you know. I'd, I, I'd like to know if there's one like that myself, you know, in a humorous sort of way. And, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know what that means. And he witnessed to me through email. And he said, Do, if you die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? To that effect, you know, even though I'd grown up in the Catholic Lutheran cult. And, uh, and, I, and I said, well, I've got a, I've got a big problem with cursing because I'd learned how to curse like a sailor and even put some sailors to, to shame, unfortunately, throughout my lost life because evil communications corrupt good manners, you know. The Bible says that, and I fell victim to that, you know. I tried hard not to, but when you're around evil communication, I don't care how strong you are, you will fall for that sin, whatever it is. And so, uh, you know, Brian led me to the Lord in early October. And before that happened, on October 2nd, I had eliminated my cell phone. Because I was getting to the point where I was having sleeping problems, mood problems, and a whole bunch of health problems from my cell phone over the years. Because of my MLM business. It was a telecommunications MLM scam. And uh, that's how I got started in it. And so, uh, you know, ever since that point, I never owned another cell phone after that. After I got saved. And, and uh, so then, that was the first time that I had earnestly and sincerely said this in his prayer. And I really, really wanted to change my life, you know, after the Lord saved me. So that month, I fell victim to the Hebrew Ritz Movement cult because of a, you know, friend connection from town, because I was involved in the political uh, spectrum of, you know, let's vote for Ron Paul so he can bring this country back to what, to what it once was, you know. And, and I sincerely believed in that ignorantly because of Infowars. And uh, so I realized that was a sin to call myself a Jew when I really am not. God never made me a Jew. God made me what I am, you know, and so I asked Brian for information on that movement and Lordship Salvation. He explained it to me, and so the Lord used Brian to convict me of my sin of falling victim to the Hebrew Ritz movement because of two Seventh-day Adventist books that I was given, National Sunday Law and Fossilized Customs, and so I said the sinner's prayer a second time, and uh, then I was, I was invited to hang out after work one day at that job that I still had in October, early October, to drink beer and hang out at this one bar after work. And I said, no. And so that was another test from the Lord to see if I would stand against that type of sin. And uh, I was told, oh, it'll be fun. You know, whole nine yards of trying to get involved in, in sin outside of work. And because of that stand, coworkers started alienating and backbiting me, you know, tail bears. And so then after I got saved, I started returning books to people that had loaned, that people had loaned me over the years to them with witnessing letters and tracts, as 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11 describes. And my last day at that job was... The, my last day at that job was Satan's favorite day, which I call October 31st, where I preached against, you know, celebrating that particular holiday and blazed Romans chapter 10, verse 9 across the entire department during my last day there. And so uh, because of that, again, people alienated me, just as the Bible says in Mark 8, 38, Mark 16, verse 15, Luke chapter 9, 26, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And that job told me why the Lord did not design men to be career women, you know, career German. And I learned the, the agenda behind all the intri intricate technicalities of equal employment and all the other stuff that goes along with careers. So since I've been saved in October of 2011, the Lord has shown me a lot of truth, especially how to trust Him without relying on technology, to include a cell phone. 
in November of that year, I had run off the road in a snowy ditch on my way home from, from an errand one day. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord worked everything out because I relied on him. I put my faith and trust in him without a cell phone. And he, he, he worked everything out perfectly. You know, got my car out of a ditch and I learned how to trust the Lord without the aid of technology. Yes, you can do it. So, and, and after that, um, I learned the agenda behind dressing immodestly really well because my first time dressing modestly like this out in public led to the fact of, of people's good manners just coming out of everywhere. I mean, people I'd never ever talked to and would never talk to regularly and hadn't throughout my past life would say hi to me, you know, open up doors for me. They would stop whatever they were doing and open up the doors for me whenever I walked into a public place. And, and so I learned what really goes on, you know, in people's minds if you dress, depending on how you're dressed. And so, uh, so then I, at a social gathering at my Catholic building with my parents, I had uh, heard the word vicar. You know, again, another confirmation from the Lord of Catholic Lutheranism similarities. And uh, that led me to dropping my, to rescinding my membership and affiliations with LCMS cult stuff permanently. And uh, I permanently rescinded any and all affiliations with that. And that caused my family to call me all sorts of of names and different things and their their countenance waxed worse and worse because I wasn't going to their cult building anymore. You know, so I got persecuted by my family because I had sent a formal letter saying rescind my affiliations with this. And so uh and I and I kept my stand of not backing down from that. And then um uh, then I attended in roughly middle November a, an IFB cult building, not f about 45 minutes from my parents' farm. And uh, I learned there that you don't need to attend a Baal worship building just to have fellowship with the Lord. You're not going to lose your fellowship with the Lord if you don't go to a Baal house, okay? You can serve the Lord and, and read his word without being told, you know, that's not the case from a hireling. And so, then I also learned that it was a 501c3 cult. And I also learned that, uh, you know, that hireling there told me that I was not, I wasn't allowed to witness for the Lord because I was just a babe in Christ at the time. So, uh, and there, and by the way, their, their pamphlets blazed weekly amount of donations needed to support their, their building all over the, the pamphlet of their service order. And, uh, that rubbed me the wrong way. So, not long after that, to sum up, you know, December of that year, I witnessed for the Lord during a job interview, which led to me not getting a call back. And I only did that, I applied for a job at that time, because my parents said, you need to have a job, you know? And I wanted to honor them the best I could, so I set aside my, my desires and I applied for a job. You know, and then in January of 2012, I again witnessed for the Lord during a job interview, which led to no call back, you know, because again, I was told you need to have a job, you know, and then not long after that, um, I submitted a formal uh, letter to my previous Boston University saying, stop claiming me as a student. I am not a student. I don't want to be a student. Just completely, permanently sever my ties with this school. And uh, they didn't understand that, so, because uh, I had read Charlotte Thompson Erzerby's Deliberate Dumbing Down of America about the agenda behind university. And so I finally emailed them and I said, you know, I called them all Satanists, <laughs> unfortunately, via email. Probably wasn't the best way to handle it, but, you know, I called them all Satanists, and finally, I was completely severed as a student at that, un at that university. I probably should have witnessed to them better, but at the time, I just 
study as that. And then during that time, I also worked at a, at a vet clinic, and one of my colleagues was a professing Christian. And yet, she declared on one occasion, you know, and the Lord understands why I'm saying this, but this is her words. She says, I guess I can try this Jesus thing, you know, calling the Lord Jesus Christ a thing. Yeah, like a Christian would do that. Okay. And yet she showed no change in her life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. She showed no evidence of a changed life despite her professing to be a Christian and despite her professing to read the King James Bible. So that experience at that vet clinic job, I was fired from that because of witnessing on the job and because my boss said I didn't fit in with the culture there, which was funny because he heard me witnessing on the job and he got offended. whoop de doo you know? Um, so then in November of that year, the Lord helped me cancel my voter's registration via a formal business letter, a shredded voter's registration card, and a gospel tract to the county auditor. And the Lord, and, uh, and so the Lord's been teaching me a lot of things ever since I've been saved. And I just want to leave you with one last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. To the weak became I as weak. Excuse me. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And that verse applies because the Lord is still showing me things and, you know, forming me according to his will and, you know, developing and molding me into what he wants me to be. So I can... I can understand, I can, I can, um, uh, understand what all of you are going, going through out there, you know? And so, um, that's essentially my testimony. I'm, I'm sorry for being long-winded, but, uh, I hope it's been a blessing to all of my saved Christian sisters out there and even some lost people out there who are searching for the truth. I just pray that you'll Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation before it's too late. I'm sorry. I. Well, there you have it. Uh, now you can see where I get some of my uh, uh, rabbit trails and things. But I'll tell you what. How do you how do you sum up your life in in a couple hours? It's. Uh, there are so many things that we can learn as Christians, and um, and I just praise the Lord for giving me a very godly wife. And uh, if you think her testimony is long, wait till you see mine when I bring mine out. Um, looking forward to talking about my testimony. There's a lot of things I want to be. I have to redo mine, and um, looking forward to getting it done. But uh, I hope this testimony has been a blessing to you, and uh, we thank you. For all the donations, all the nice words, all the people that have pray, pr said that they're praying for me and, and, of course, my wife. Now you know who she is. Now you know her story. Um, like I said at the beginning, there's a lot of uh, details about her life. A lot of things that she needed to get out. And so uh, that's why we did this. That's why we put this thing together. Uh, please pray for us as we continue to serve the Lord. Um, as you can see, I have a very detail-oriented wife, and um, she is a great help to the ministry. And I can say this out there, if you're out there and you're single, and you're really wanting to get married, and you're thinking, man, I just, I got to compromise or something, don't compromise. I was 36 years old when I got married. My wife here, uh, she was 29 when we got married. And um, If you wait on the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. Yep. And, and then some. If you just trust and have faith in Him. So, it's worth the wait. Okay? Um, I realized that if I had married the wrong person, the wrong woman, I would not be in ministry today. And I was very paranoid about the kind of a woman I wanted to marry. And so, I uh, really put my wife through, the, through the, uh, the test here and stuff like that. Really talked a lot about the Bible. And that's something else. Don't go out dating and fun and let's we enjoy the same movies. and That's worldly stuff. Talk about the things of the Lord. 
and if she's in line with scripture, um, it'll make a good marriage. So that's going to be it. I got to quit because I'm about freezing to death here. I don't have uh, as warm a clothes on as my wife. I wasn't smart enough to wear warmer clothes. Uh huh. But uh, sure. We thank you very much to everybody out there that that prays for us. We thank you for those who have donated, and uh, keep watching. When we get our ministry headquarters, we're gonna be bringing out a lot more information for you. So. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, which ties in with what you said about clothes, quick. is that <laughs> such a jokester. Um, is that 100% natural fibers like. This is 100% wool. This is 100% wool. You know, 100% cotton. They will keep you warmer and regulated regardless of the season throughout the year than the synthetic junk that's out there. You know, acrylic, yep. polyester, all the other stuff that they try and, and uh, copy the natural fibers. Okay. Stick with natural fibers. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.